For over 20 years, Saddam Hussein strangled the life out of the Iraqi people. This brutal dictator started from nothing and by the age of 20 joined an extremist group in which he would quickly rise through the ranks. He went to law school, spent time in jail, and betrayed some of his closest friends to seize power. Saddam sentenced hundreds of people to death to ensure no one could oppose his power. He tortured and killed thousands of Iraqi civilians. He was one of the most brutal dictators in history, and his rise to power reflects the horror that would become his reign. On April 28, 1937, Saddam Hussein was born in Al Auja, a small village about eight miles out of the city of Tikrit in Iraq. When Saddam was born, this area is one of the poorest in the country. His father died before he was brought into the world, which only made his life that much more difficult in rural Iraq. Young Saddam was raised in poverty, where he would rarely get enough to eat. At some point, his family sent him to live with his uncle in Baghdad. It's been reported that Saddam was beaten at home and bullied by other children. This is a common thread in the makings of an insane dictator. However, there are also plenty of people who have had very difficult childhoods and haven't become murderous and oppressive rulers. In 1957, at the age of 20, Saddam Hussein joined the Ba'ath Party. The Ba'ath Party advocated for a pan-Arab socialist nation. Different branches had popped up in the Middle East, but the Ba'ath Party itself began in 1943 in Damascus, Syria to oppose imperialism and colonialism in the region. The leaders of the Ba'ath Party claimed that they were guided by the positive values of Islamic principles. However, the organization began as authoritarian in nature, and therefore, the good of the masses was never really a part of their agenda. Instead, the Ba'ath Party wanted to seize power and sculpt the Middle East into their version of what Islam should be. To prepare for his future, Saddam Hussein attended Cairo Law School in 1962. He only lasted a year before moving back to Iraq, at which point the Ba'ath Party took control of the Iraqi government in what was called the Ramadan Revolution. Saddam continued his studies at Baghdad Law College to ensure that he had the foundation to rise through politics and eventually become a prominent member of the party. It's worth noting that everything Saddam Hussein does is cold and calculated. He knew that he'd either hold a position of power or die trying. However, what would happen next would all but crush Saddam Hussein's dreams. It would lead him and other Ba'athists to take drastic action and plunge the country into chaos. The same year the Ba'ath Party took control of the government, they were overthrown. Saddam Hussein was arrested and sent to jail. While incarcerated, he thought a lot about why and how his party had failed to maintain power. He looked for people to blame and ways to strengthen the party's position once he got out. For those of you who are paying attention, this might sound awfully familiar to what Adolf Hitler did before becoming a prominent member of the Nazi party, and you would be right. While in prison, Saddam concluded that the reason the Ba'athists did not succeed was due to the weak leaders who put too much faith in the Iraqi military supporting them. By 1966, Saddam Hussein had become the deputy secretary of the regional command. He was still in prison but continued to rise through the party's ranks, and it was in this position that he decided to create a Ba'athist security force that could be used to do the party's bidding. Even more important was the fact that this new militant group would be loyal to Saddam and the Ba'athist cause, thereby eliminating the problem that had lost them the power during their first revolution. By the time Saddam Hussein escaped prison, he was one of the most influential leaders of the Ba'ath Party. He immediately started using his newly organized private security force to wreak havoc in Baghdad. Saddam would order the harassment or assassination of people who opposed the Ba'athists. Civilians were terrorized, while any political opponent to Saddam's vision of the future was eliminated. When Saddam Hussein got out of prison, the president of Iraq was a man by the name of Abd al-Salam Arif. He was seen by Saddam and the rest of the Ba'ath Party leadership as weak and the reason the party was forced underground after the Ramadan revolution had failed. In 1968, the Ba'athists launched another revolution. However, this time Saddam Hussein played a bigger role. He reorganized the party's leadership and power structure while ensuring he retained as much influence as possible. Ahmad Hassan al-Bakar rose to the top of the organization, becoming secretary of the regional leadership of the Ba'ath Party in 1964. And now Saddam Hussein was his right-hand man. Saddam's job was to use his enforcers to rally support amongst the general population for al-Bakar, and if people couldn't be persuaded, he would use terror to make sure they fell in line. In July of 1968, the Ba'athists launched their second revolution to remove the Arif regime. The Ba'ath Party gained support from both the army and civilians to carry out the coup. They cited corruption within the government, the inadequacy by which the Arif regime was dealing with Kurdish disturbances in the north, its lack of support for other Arab nations in the Six-Day War of 1967 against Israel, and Arif's subservience to President Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt as grounds for overthrowing the current ruler. Almost all of these accusations were true. 
but it was the fact that the Arif regime was always heavily relying on the Iraqi military to maintain its power and never held popular elections to establish legitimacy that allowed the Ba'ath Party to gather large amounts of support from the Iraqi people to depose the government. The Arif regime had failed to gain the support of the masses, and this would lead to their downfall. In order to seize control of the government, the Ba'ath Party paid off or persuaded a number of key officers to abandon their current regime and join them. There were four major contributors to the eventual downfall of Abd al-Salam Arif. The first was Abd al-Razak al-Naif, the head of military intelligence, and Colonel Ibrahim Abd al-Rahman al-Daoud, who was chief of the Republican Guard. Both of these men agreed to support the revolution as long as they could increase their standings in the government when the Ba'ath Party took control. Al Naif wanted to be the new premier, and Al Daoud had his sights set on the Minister of Defense position. Saddam agreed to this, and both men were on board. Then there were the two colonels in the Iraqi army, named Sadun Haidan and Hamad Shihab, who agreed to help the Ba'ath Party as long as Arif was not harmed. Saddam agreed to this as well, but there was very little chance he was going to let the current president make it out of the coup alive if he had his way. The same went for Al Naif and Al Daoud. The Ba'ath Party needed military support, but they had no intention of keeping their promises to non-party members. These men were a means to an end, and when the Ba'athists gained power, their promises were all but forgotten. On July 17, 1968, President Arif's palace was overrun by Ba'athist soldiers led by Ahmad Hassan al-Bakhar. Arif was captured and willingly agreed to leave Iraq in return for his life being spared. Once the Ba'ath Party seized control, they established the Revolutionary Command Council, which became the supreme authority within Iraq. Due to his prominent role in the Ba'ath Party, al-Bakar was chosen as the new president of Iraq. However, he had very little interest in the day-to-day -day administrative operations of running a country. For this, he turned to his favorite and most loyal officer, Saddam Hussein. As time passed, al-Bakar's health began to deteriorate. He became sicker and sicker, at which point Saddam Hussein was given more and more power. While Abakar was in the spotlight as president, Saddam worked behind the scenes to create a government that had absolute control of the country. He was a highly influential politician, and his agenda was a progressive one. However, the way he made change consisted of brutal torture and calculated murder. In order to modernize Iraq, Saddam ordered funds to be used for improving infrastructure, the healthcare system, social services, and education. The amount of money spent on these sectors was unparalleled by any other nation in the region. Saddam also nationalized the oil industry, which brought in huge amounts of money for the regime. But not everything he did was for the betterment of the Iraqi people. Saddam Hussein also helped develop the country's first chemical weapons program, bolstered the numbers of his security force to control the population, and frequently used terror tactics to get what he wanted. A lot of the more nefarious activities Saddam engaged in were done in secret, but this wasn't always the case. When the general population voiced any sort of discontent with the way things were being run in Iraq, Saddam and his allies would use very public force to show they would not tolerate such behavior. To maintain control of the media, several foreign journalists reporting in Iraq were arrested and accused of being Israeli spies. Seventeen of the journalists were put on trial and condemned to death by hanging. The people of Iraq watched as the journalists and their own freedom were hung in Liberation Square in Baghdad. But it wasn't just civilians who were suffering under the new regime, things in the Ba'ath Party itself were becoming tense. A group led by Al Naif and Al Daoud claimed that they wanted a more socialist structure and a more lenient foreign policy, but in reality, it was just a fight over who would ultimately control the regime. Saddam would not allow anything to jeopardize his standing in the party or the status quo, so on July 30, 1968, he had Al Naif arrested. However, in this particular circumstance, Saddam showed some restraint promised to spare Al Naif's life if he left the country and became the ambassador to Morocco. But he could never return. Al Daoud was already out of the country on a mission to Jordan and was ordered to remain there or he would be arrested if he ever stepped foot back in Iraq. With the problem dealt with, the Ba'ath Party had loyal supporters in all parts of the government. More importantly, Saddam Hussein had men he could trust in key positions, and al Bakar was technically still president and chairman of the Revolutionary Command Council, but it was Saddam who was sculpting the future of Iraq. This was all done during the first few weeks of the new regime. Saddam forced between two and 3,000 Army and Air Force officers to retire as they were considered a security risk to the new government. Many of these men supported President Nasser of Egypt, and even with the purge, the Ba'ath Party still had to contend with sympathizers for several years. The Revolutionary Command Council claimed power until the next National Assembly was called. But even when this happened, almost every position was filled by Ba'ath Party members, so no real elections happened. This meant that even the civilian party members in the government were now loyalists of Saddam. 
In the coming months, almost every part of the government, including the military, would be run by the people who were not just devoted to the party, but also respected or feared Saddam Hussein. Even though he only held the position of vice president, he was slowly gaining complete control of Iraq. As mentioned, Saddam had grand plans for the country, however his reforms were put on hold almost immediately as Kurdish forces tried to overthrow the new Ba'ath government. The Kurdish rebellion was dealt with using inhumane amounts of force. Entire villages were decimated and innocent Kurdish civilians were slaughtered in their homes. Saddam Hussein acted as chief government negotiator between the Ba'athist regime and the Kurdish leaders. However, this didn't seem to solve the problem in the long run. Saddam realized that since Iran had funded the Kurdish militants, the only way to actually deal with this threat was to come to some sort of agreement with the leadership of the neighboring country. In March 1974, Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi government once again went to war with the Kurds. The Shah of Iran supported the Kurds this time as well. However, several months after the fighting started, the Iraqi and Iranian governments came to an agreement. Iran suspended its support of the Kurds, and the war quickly ended. Kurdish forces were given a few days to retreat into Iran before the Ba'athist government took complete control of Iraqi Kurdistan and implemented their oppressive rule over the region. During this time, Saddam also began to improve Iraq's relationship with other Arab countries in the region. One key economic point for Saddam was to reverse the isolationist policies that had been in place for years. The diplomatic talks with Iran culminated in the Algiers Agreement in 1975, ultimately leading Iran to withdraw its support to the Iraqi Kurds in return for greater access to the Persian Gulf. This was the beginning of several diplomatic relationships that Saddam cultivated during his time as vice president. Saddam continuously worked to improve relations with most of the Gulf states, and in 1975, when President Anwar Sadat of Egypt and President Ghaffar Mohammed El Nimeri of Sudan visited Baghdad, Saddam made promises that they could all work together to create a more powerful Arab world. The only Arab country that did not improve relations with Iraq was Syria. Ironically, this country was also ruled by a Ba'athist regime, but there was very little cooperation between the two governments. This was because each regime wanted to become more influential than the other and become the dominant leader behind a united Middle East. As a result, the Syrian and Iraqi governments tried to undermine one another constantly. Saddam had little time for these games and focused his attention and energy instead on ensuring the Ba'ath Party in Iraq continued to maintain control of the country. Instead of fighting a battle for legitimacy with Syria, Saddam criticized the Syrian Ba'ath Party as going against Islamic ideals. He claimed that the Syrian government was working with Israel, which most of the Arab world saw as the enemy. Saddam also used Israel to unite the people and governments in the region as well. Throughout the 1970s, he employed anti-Israeli rhetoric to gain more support for Iraq. He claimed that the Arab world was not yet ready to go to war against Israel, but if they put their trust in him, he could help Iraq and the rest of the Middle East gain a strategic advantage over their common enemy. His plan was simple. First, he would focus the country's resources on economic, technological, and military growth. This would ensure that Iraq could defend itself from any foreign threat while spreading its influence and crushing Israel in the process. He told the Iraqi people that before any of this could be realized, Iraq needed to be turned into a fortress, meaning reforms at home must be enacted before branching out. Then and only then would Iraq be able to lead the rest of the Arab nations in a war against Israel. During this time of internal investment in Iraq's economic and military sectors, their nuclear and biological weapons programs got started. Crazy thing about this period is that Saddam Hussein was making drastic changes and influencing the course of the entire country as the vice president. He technically was not the leader of Iraq, as Ahmed Hassan al-Bakhar was still technically in charge. However, Saddam didn't let this stand in his way. In fact, he likely used his less prominent position to work in the shadows and created a nation that could easily be controlled once he became the president in the future. Saddam Hussein and many others in the Ba'ath Party knew that it was only a matter of time before he took over. No one was under the illusion that there would ever be elections or any type of discussion over who would succeed al-Bakhar. By 1977, everyone understood that al-Bakhar was only a figurehead and Saddam Hussein was the real authority in Iraq. Using everything he learned from the failed revolution in 1963 and over the years controlling the party and general population through force and fear, Saddam would no longer allow anyone to question his authority. Any dissent within the Ba'ath Party was quickly crushed and any outside opposition was annihilated. Saddam was not about to allow anyone, even the Iraqi people, to meddle with his plans for the country. Throughout this time as vice president, Saddam put relatives in positions of power. In many cases, kinship was much more important than skill, as he wanted loyalty above all else. Family and tribe members were much more trustworthy than someone from another part of the country. 
For example, Saddam filled the Presidential Guard with members of the al bu Nasir and allied Sunni tribes from which he originated. This also ensured that the security forces and the military were loyal to him, which was important for enforcing his laws and ensuring no one got out of line. Saddam was ready to be in charge, with no one else above him. He might have been loyal to al bakar but now all of his chess pieces were in place. However, al bakar was about to do something shocking, a move that could effectively render Saddam Hussein powerless. This decision prompted Saddam to take drastic action. In 1979, President Ahmed Hassan al-Bakar tried to unite Iraq and Syria in a move that would break down many of the structures that Saddam had put in place to control the country. Obviously, this could not be allowed, so Saddam immediately began scheming to force al-Bakar out of power. He had no intentions of assassinating the president or starting a power struggle, so instead Saddam made al-Bakar resign. It's unclear how he did this exactly, but he likely threatened the former president into resigning. On July 16, 1979, al-Bakar stepped down and Saddam Hussein officially became the president of Iraq. Al-Bakar was put under house arrest, where he would stay until his death in 1982. However, there were still many in the government who wanted to keep al-Bakar in power and Saddam knew it, so he came up with a scheme to ensure his transition to president and ruler of Iraq would not be opposed. Less than a week after Saddam forced al-Bakar to resign, he called a meeting of the Ba'ath Party. When everyone arrived, Saddam Hussein read off a list of 68 names. Each person on the list was considered a threat to Saddam and was immediately arrested. They were stripped of their positions and thrown in jail. Following the arrests, Muyi Abd al-Hussein al-Mashhadi, the former secretary of the Revolutionary Command Council, made a public confession that he was part of a plot to overthrow the government. There is very little doubt that al-Mashhadi was tortured and forced to provide a false confession, but Saddam needed a reason to get rid of anyone he deemed a threat to his power. Saddam claimed that the coup was funded by the Syrian government, effectively severing any ties that al-Bakar had formed with the other Ba'ath Party and allowing Saddam to paint them as the enemy. When the 68 conspirators were brought to trial, they were all found guilty of treason and 22 of the most vocal members were sentenced to death. What is particularly sadistic about Saddam's purge was that many of the men who were killed were once his protégés. He knew how well they had been trained and was not about to become a puppet to any of his underlings like al-Bakar had been to him. But Saddam didn't stop there. Everyone knew he was controlling al-Bakar from behind the scenes, but the former president still had some power within the government. Now that there had been a shift in power at the very top, others came out of the woodwork to try to oppose Saddam. Hundreds of politicians who posed any threat to Saddam's power were rounded up by his private security force and thrown in jail. Hundreds more were executed or murdered. Now Saddam Hussein was the president, chairman of the Revolutionary Command Council, secretary general and commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Basically, Saddam controlled it all. Everyone in the government knew that double-crossing or speaking out against Saddam was as good as a death sentence, and any connection to Syria would no longer be tolerated. On top of using his secret police to assassinate opponents and brutally suppress opposition, Saddam also created a cult of personality among the general population of Iraq. He idolized himself and told the populace he wanted to make Iraq the strongest country in the region, and sacrifices would need to be made. He claimed everything he did was in the best interest of the Iraqi people, and that anyone who thought otherwise was a danger to the Arabic way of life. His first goal was to make Iraq the central power in the Persian Gulf, but while he did that, he provided the people of Iraq with universal health care and free education. He even improved rights for women, although only small gains were made on this front. What Saddam was doing as president was initially making the lives of the Iraqi people better, so they would trust him. These reforms would not last forever, and many quickly fell to the wayside as Saddam shifted his focus to gaining more power in the region. The same year that Saddam became president, a very real external threat arose in Iran. Ruhollah Khomeini led an Islamic revolution that was supported by the Shiite majority. Saddam's power hinged on the support of the minority Sunni population in Iraq, and if a similar revolution were to happen within his borders, it could be disastrous. To stop the Shiite revolution from spreading to Iraq, Saddam Hussein ordered the Iraqi military to invade Khuzestan in western Iran in September of 1980. This was done for a couple of reasons. The first was to proactively suppress any talk of a Shiite uprising. The second was that the Khuzestan region had large amounts of oil. This was obviously a deciding factor for Saddam as he needed more money to fund his military and improve the state of his nation. The invasion of Khuzestan led to the Iran-Iraq War. Luckily for Saddam, Western nations and many Arab countries threw their support behind him in the conflict. This was because the revolution in Iran was centered around extremist Islamic ideologies, and much of the world didn't want to see this type of revolution spread to the rest of the region. 
The irony was that Saddam Hussein was clearly the aggressor in the conflict, but this didn't stop nations around the world from supporting him. Saddam received financial and military aid from the United States, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, France, Italy, Yugoslavia, and the majority of Arab countries. On the other side, Iran was supported by Syria, Libya, China, North Korea, Israel, Pakistan, and South Yemen. When Saddam started using chemical weapons, the global community became a little wary. However, stopping the spread of radical Islamist ideas was more important than war crimes, so many nations, including Western powers, turned a blind eye to the atrocities that Saddam was carrying out, which included the genocide of the Kurdish people, crimes against humanity, and the aggressive invasion of his neighbor. Eight years later, the war had reached a stalemate. Then, in 1988, a ceasefire was called. Hundreds of thousands of people were dead on both sides of the conflict. But it wasn't just soldiers. Innocent civilians were slaughtered by both militaries and caught in the crossfire of missiles and aerial strikes. Iraq was now deep in debt to the countries that supported Saddam during the war. However, rather than focus on helping the economy of Iraq recover from almost a decade of fighting and huge disruptions in oil production and exports, Saddam instead continued to pour money into his military. This led to almost all the economic and social policies that Saddam promised the people of Iraq to be put on the back burners. The quality of healthcare and education began to decline. The population began to suffer as the economy collapsed. Rather than trying to fix things at home, Saddam set his sights on another nation rich in oil that he could invade. At this point, Saddam Hussein maintained control of Iraq almost solely through his private security force and the military. Many Sunni citizens still supported Saddam and the Ba'ath Party, but the Shiite majority had become discontent. Also, even some Sunnis were unhappy with the failure of the war against Iran and the empty promises that Saddam Hussein had made. However, the population was too afraid to voice their displeasure. If anyone was thought to be inciting opposition to the current regime, they were quickly arrested or killed by Saddam's men. The economic struggle led to Saddam to take more drastic actions. Saddam ordered his forces to invade the country of Kuwait to the south. His plan was to use Kuwait's vast oil reserves to pay off his debts and improve Iraq's economy. If all went according to plans, he could get his economic and social reforms back on track. In August of 1990, Iraqi troops crossed into Kuwait and the invasion began. However, unlike the invasion of Iran, Saddam's attack on Kuwait backfired on the international stage and led countries worldwide to enact trade embargoes against Iraq. The United Nations passed resolutions condemning Saddam's use of force against Kuwait and authorized the use of force to end the conflict. The United States led a joint military mission into the region to combat Saddam's forces and push them out of Kuwait. On January 16, 1991, the Persian Gulf War started. U.S. aircraft conducted a relentless bombing campaign against Saddam's forces. The aerial bombardment lasted for 42 days and decimated Iraqi tanks, soldiers, and military sites. U.S. tanks roared across the sands of Kuwait, laying waste to any resistance in their path. Six weeks after the war started, it was over. All of Saddam's forces had been pushed out of Kuwait and a ceasefire agreement was signed. Unfortunately for Iraq's dictator, all economic sanctions levied against Iraq remained in place even after the war was over. On top of that, Saddam was forced to dismantle his biological and chemical weapons programs. Even though his military was in shambles and quickly forced out of Kuwait once US-led forces engaged them, Saddam still claimed the conflict as a victory for Iraq. Although the rest of the world knew this was all a ruse, the claiming of victory by a dictator even in the face of a major defeat is nothing new. Saddam Hussein had complete control of the media in the country. Many Iraqi citizens had been brainwashed to believe anything Saddam and his regime said was the truth. Just like other dictators, Saddam knew he needed to control the narrative if he was going to keep his power, so he did just that. However, not everyone in Iraq was fooled. Both the Shiites and the Kurds, who had been oppressed or slaughtered by Saddam and his government, began to rebel. They could see by the defeats in both Iran and Kuwait that the current government was struggling. However, within the borders of Iraq, Saddam still controlled the military and his security force. Any uprisings that began were violently suppressed. Thousands of Shia Muslims and Kurds were forced to flee Iraq in fear of their lives. They were put into refugee camps along the northern border of the country. However, those who were captured were tortured and killed. Some were sent to prisons, never to be heard from again. Iraq's economy was in shambles. People were being murdered by Saddam's regime every day. Human rights violations ran rampant. The international community closely watched as Iraq seemed like it would implode at any moment. The population of Iraq endured years of pain and suffering, but perhaps Saddam's biggest mistake following the Gulf War was not cooperating with the UN mandates and sanctions that had been placed on the country. Saddam was ordered to stop the production of all chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. 
However, whenever UN arms inspectors requested access to Iraqi facilities, Saddam refused. This was obviously a cause for concern and a decision that would lead to Saddam Hussein's downfall. In 1998, when Saddam once again refused UN inspectors access to his facilities, a four-day airstrike was carried out by the United States and Great Britain known as Desert Fox. After the strike, both nations said they would support the opposition mounting against Saddam. His worst fears were quickly becoming a reality. For decades, he had ruled using fear and brutality. These tactics no longer seemed to work as the population turned against him. Intelligence reports coming out of Iraq uncovered that Saddam's regime was becoming increasingly ruthless. Because of the UN sanctions, money coming into the nation had slowed drastically. Without a steady cash flow to improve the economy and empty promises of improvement, the general population no longer trusted their president. The only way for Saddam to keep power was to continuously kill or lock up any opposition that arose. But like all dictators, Saddam had illusions of grandeur and never imagined that his power could be taken away. He began grooming his sons, Uday and Kuse, to succeed him as if nothing was wrong. In Saddam's mind, his control over the military and therefore the people of Iraq meant his lineage would continue to rule the country. Both his sons were quickly rising through the ranks of the government and held senior positions by the time the US and the UK started backing Saddam's opponents. In order to combat what was happening abroad and foreign powers meddling in the affairs of his country, Saddam started anti-American propaganda campaigns. He blamed the West and the US in particular for the shortcomings of his own government. He told the Iraqi people that the United States was the reason they were suffering. And since Saddam had such a stranglehold on the country, many people fed into this rhetoric. But we can't forget the reason Saddam hadn't been removed from power sooner was that the people in Iraq were afraid of him and his security forces. Other conservative and extremist leaders in the region supported Saddam in his defiance of the US. Terrorist groups and radicals saw him as the only leader who would stand up to US aggression in the region. On September 11, 2001, when Al-Qaeda terrorists flew two planes into the World Trade Center towers and another into the Pentagon, the United States launched its war on terror. There was a real concern that Saddam would harbor terrorist groups within Iraq's borders and may even provide them with chemical or biological weapons. In turn, the US stepped up its aggressiveness around Saddam, allowing UN inspectors in Iraq to make sure he was adhering to the agreements of the Gulf War. In November 2002, UN inspectors were once again denied access to Iraqi facilities. The United States and Britain ended all diplomacy with Saddam and prepared for war. On March 17, 2003, President George W. Bush publicly ordered Saddam to step down and relinquish power to the people of Iraq. The ultimatum gave Saddam Hussein 48 hours to comply or the US would attack. After the Iraqi dictator refused to step down, the United States launched the Iraq War. The first shots were fired by US aircraft that conducted a bombing run on the bunker complex that Saddam Hussein was thought to be meeting with other members of his government in. When it was discovered that Saddam was not in the bunker but still operating within Iraq, the United States intensified its attacks. It was clear the main goal of the invasion was to find Saddam Hussein either dead or alive. While US troops hunted, Saddam told Iraqi citizens to lay down their lives for him. He used the invasion as a way to rally anyone who had fallen for his anti-US rhetoric, but any resistance that was mounted soon succumbed to the advancing American and British forces. Less than a month later, Baghdad fell, and Saddam had to go deep into hiding. Much of the Iraqi population embraced the removal of the mad dictator from power and celebrated the fact that they no longer had to fear Saddam Hussein. This didn't mean the future was bright or that rebuilding the country would be easy, but for many it was a small relief from decades of brutality enacted on them by Saddam Hussein. On December 13, 2003, the US gained intelligence about two locations where Saddam might have been hiding. The mission to capture Saddam was called Operation Red Dawn after the movie from the 1980s. The two locations were given the names Wolverine 1 and Wolverine 2, both of which were located near the town of Tikrit to the northwest of Baghdad. This is around where Saddam Hussein was born, so it seemed as if the dictator had scurried back to his home. Around 600 men made up of the 1st Brigade Combat Team and C Squadron Delta Force were deployed to the area. Both detachments cleared their locations, but there was no sign of Saddam. Disheartened, the choppers were called in to extract the men. Seemed like their intel was bad. As one soldier moved out of a compound his team had just secured, he kicked a piece of wood lying on the ground. It moved slightly, revealing an opening. The soldier moved the board aside, revealing a hidden tunnel system. Afraid the insurgents might use it to ambush the troops in the area, the soldier grabbed a frag grenade. He was about to throw it in the hole when a man covered in dirt appeared with his hands raised. The soldier could not believe his eyes. Staring up at him from the hole was Saddam Hussein. The soldier hit Saddam in the head with the stock of his gun in case he was planning to go out guns blazing. 
He then removed a concealed Glock from Saddam and called for backup. His squadmates rushed over, shocked to find their brother in arms with the most wanted man in the world, handcuffed on the ground. Saddam Hussein was escorted into a chopper and flown back to the Tikrit mission support site where he was properly identified before being flown to Baghdad. For all of his talk of killing Americans and threatening the United States, Saddam Hussein gave up without a fight and with no shots fired. The soldiers who searched the hole Saddam was hiding in found an AK-47 and $750,000 in US banknotes. It seemed as if Saddam was going to make a run for it, but had no real plan when his hiding place was uncovered. Saddam Hussein went to trial before the Iraqi High Tribunal on October 2005. His trial lasted for nine months, during which he constantly screamed at the tribunal and interrupted the proceedings with angry outbursts. In the end, he was convicted of crimes against humanity, including willful killing, illegal imprisonment, deportation, and torture. The tribunal sentenced Saddam Hussein to death by hanging. On December 30, 2006, the sentence was carried out at a joint Iraqi-American military base called Camp Justice, located in Kazmain, a northeastern suburb of Baghdad. As his body swung above the ground, Saddam's life came to an end, and the Iraqi people were finally free from the man who caused so much pain and suffering in their country. Now watch how SEAL Team took down Osama bin Laden minute by minute, or check out why Iran is terrified of its people.